The value of money. What do we mean by the value of money? We don't really talk about money in our homes, and we definitely don't learn about the value of money inside our primary schools. In fact, I think that as kids, we're supposed to maybe just get it by osmosis, and then as adults, we're supposed to just be good with money until we realize that we are not. But we know that understanding the value of money is important because we depend on money in our everyday lives. In fact, we use money 24-7. We use it to eat, we use it for transportation, we use it for communication, we use it for data, to access information. And whether you ride into work looks like this, or whether you get your lunch from somewhere that looks like this, we use money to access the most basic of civilized human activities. But there's more to money. Actually, because of our constant interaction with it, our relationship with money really does define our own identity. And by choosing how we acquire money and how we spend it and what we spend it on, it even shapes our moral compass and directs it. So it would seem natural that we would prioritize learning about money in our education system, especially since we also know from our friend Simon, who spoke earlier, that human behaviors are shaped within us by the time we're age seven, and research has shown that good and bad financial habits are formed for the rest of our lives by the time that we're seven years old. But what's more is that money is changing fast. In my own generation, I've seen money go from paper to plastic to code. When I grew up, money was something that I could hold. I could touch it, I could hear it, I could even taste it. But I don't recommend licking coins. <laughs> and I learned something about it with one of these a piggy bank. But today, money actually looks like this. It's magically dispensed with the swipe of a plastic card, it beeps, and it lives inside our phones. Our kids are growing up in the age of Minecraft, YouTube, Netflix, Snapchat, and the rise of digital currencies, such as those inside games like Fortnite or Roblox to those that live on blockchain like Bitcoin, Ethereum or Wallow means that whether we're comfortable with it or not or whether we really believe in it or not, money is changing. And when it comes to talking about money with our children today, there's a disconnect. <laughs> now, why am I telling you this? Because like Simon, I also experiment on my own children. This is Alex, age five, and Rocky, age one. And two years ago, I wanted to find a way to introduce my kids to money in a world where money looks vastly different to when I grew up in. And for the last two years, I've had the privilege of working with a great group of people in London to create something called Pigsby, which is a new way for families to manage pocket money and uh, teach kids age six and up how to earn, how to save, and how to spend money in a digital world. Now, here's uh, one we made earlier, as they say. And um, the, the reason I did all of this is because I think that we need a new way to future-proof the value of money. And one of the things that I had to do when I started on this journey was really truly understand what does the value of money mean? Does understanding the value of money mean this? Stock markets, foreign exchanges, trading, or maybe it means this? Understanding that work equals money and that's how we get it. Or maybe it's about luxuries, is it about the things that we own, is it about accumulating stuff? Is understanding the value of money about wealth? Or is it about 
what we can achieve as individuals and as a collective. And like anybody who's looking forward, I knew that I had to start my journey by looking backwards. And I thought that maybe some of the answers to the future of financial education could be found in our past, or at the very least, my own past. So I decided to give my mom a ring and discover what it was like for her to learn about money almost half a century ago. And to my mom who's watching this, I apologize if there are things that will embarrass you here. Now, my mom grew up in 1950s Italy, Milan. The circulating currency was the Italian lira. Things were much simpler then. This up there is my mom with her four brothers and sisters. And five lira back then afforded you a small ice cream while 10 of them a big one, which my mom and her sister bought on the way back from school whenever they could afford one. And each of the brothers and sisters had chores around the house for which they earned a little bit of pocket money. And my mom's particular hustle, being the oldest daughter, was ironing shirts for granddad. And each of the kids saved money inside a tin can which was provided to them courtesy of the local bank. And the first thing that she remembers buying with the money that she saved was a hula hoop. <laughs> the Fitbit of the 20th century which she bought with her brothers and sisters as a collective who all pitched in to buy this toy. And as the kids grew older and became teenagers, they all started getting interested in music, and instead of buying hula hoops, they started buying records. And while I know that you all know who these guys up here are, what all of you don't know is that George Harrison was, in fact, my mom's teenage crush. And according to her, at the time, her boyfriend. <laughs> and the first record that the kids brought home, much to my grandma's horror, was Twist and Shout. And there was a lot of drama with grandma and grandpa over the leg shake move dance that they had to do to the song. And you don't want to know what happened when they brought home an Elvis record. But. The grandparents survived, and my mom's need to decode the love letters from the Beatles that they were writing to her flourished into a keen interest in languages. And the one thing that she lived and worked for as a young woman out of university was, in fact, traveling. After securing a top job at a publisher in Milan, earning 800,000 lira a month translating books from Russian to Italian, and 5,000 lira per hour per lesson teaching Italian to foreigners, she earned enough money to buy herself a car, a Citroen DS, which she utilized to travel all over Europe, across the Alps, into France, Spain, England, and one spring, even across Germany, through the Iron Curtain, onto Moscow, to see the gilded domes of the Kremlin that she'd read so much about. Traveling and languages remained one of my mom's lifelong passions, which she eventually shared with my dad, who, for the avoidance of doubt, is not George Harrison, <laughs> but was, in fact, one of her students. And to this day, my dad's Italian is still questionable. <laughs> but I am here. And when I asked my mom what the value of money meant to her 50 years ago, the answer was that it meant freedom. To her, money meant the freedom to live the life that she wanted as opposed to the life that she was meant to as a young woman growing up in the 60s. Now let's fast forward a couple of decades, and who can tell me who this guy is? You're wrong. That's my teenage sister's boyfriend. <laughs> and of course, Kurt Cobain. But, uh, you know, I grew up in the late 90s. I am a millennial. You have heard of my kind. There are many of you in the audience, which means that, you know, we can all be found hanging around TED Talks. And while I don't remember exactly what my piggy bank looked like, 
I do remember that I had one because I have memories of tipping the coins over on the carpet and piling them up, counting them over and over again, dreaming about all of the toys and all of the games that I could buy with them. And while we didn't get paid for chores in my house, we just had to help because we had to, my sister and I were nevertheless encouraged to cultivate an entrepreneurial mindset and find ways that we could earn money. So at age seven, after learning how to use a tape recorder, I created a radio show called Radio Philo, <laughs> reporting on household events. <laughs> Harry the hamster escaped for the fifth time. <laughs> Sisters writing a love letter to Nirvana again. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And I loaned the tapes to my relatives for a few thousand lira pop, which in the context of this talk does seem like a lot of ice cream, but that's 40 years of inflation for you. But the one memory that I have and that I cherish, which I regard as an almost religious experience, up there with seeing the film Total Recall for the first time, is Pokemon Blue. <laughs> the first game for the Game Boy that I bought with my own savings. Now the game is about an adventure. You travel through a map, you capture these creatures, you train them, you make them battle, and the motto of the game is, got to catch them all. And I did. All 151 of them. I discovered every secret, every hack, and every glitch inside that game. I reached total mastery. But the penny really dropped, no pun intended, when I learned how to clone Pokemon. <laughs> There's a trading system inside the game that allows two players to connect two Game Boys with a cable and trade the Pokemon that they captured. And what I learned is that by exploiting the saving speed of the Game Boy and disconnecting the cable, before the trade completed, you effectively cloned a Pokemon. <laughs> it's true, you can Google this. <laughs> and for some time, I was the only person in my school that knew about this. So for two solid weeks, I charged my school friends 5,000 lira pop to take their Game Boy home with me, stay up all night cloning, and return them a cartridge with a full set of Pokemons the morning after. Now, I was eventually caught by my teachers, who had to tell my parents, who had to confiscate my Game Boy, and it was all the better because they thought it was going to fry my brain. And when I managed to make a comeback onto the Pokemon scene, all the kids at school were cloning, and I'd lost my edge. But to this day, I remember my time as a Pokemon kingpin with great pride. And when you ask me today what the value of money meant to me back then, it meant validation. It meant validation that mastery over something that I was so passionate about and that I truly loved was not just valuable to me, but to other people as well. And when I think about my time as a child, the mastery over a subject, but the interest over play that I had is what then allowed me to create my own identity around money, not only as a creator, but also as an entrepreneur. There are five billion dollars that change hands within a family nucleus every week in countries like South Korea, the United States, Japan, and Europe. Much more when you start counting countries like China, continents like South America, Africa, and other parts of Asia for things like chores, tooth fairies, gifts, presents, allowances. I like to call these piggy banking moments. These are the precious interactions between grown-ups and children that allows children to learn and to experience money 
in a way that allows them to create their own identity around it. And while some of you in the audience may think that my mother was particularly progressive for her time, or I was unique in my entrepreneurial endeavors, my point is that every one of us in the audience, I'm willing to bet, has their own version of these stories. The lemonade stands, the paper routes, and helping our kids understand the value of money is about helping them create these memories as well. My wife and I, we don't own a motorized vehicle. If I want to get somewhere, I just pull up my phone, a car picks me up and takes me where I need to go. It took my mom three years to save enough money to put a down payment for a car, and today I can travel to Moscow and back for the same price of an Italian lesson back then. And by the time my kids are going to have to drive and travel, I'm willing to bet that they won't need to. Cars will drive themselves. Music is changing as well. We don't own records anymore. We just pay for subscription to streaming services. And the video game industry and the movie industry are all going the same way. There won't be any cartridges. There won't be any cables to trade and play with. That's already a thing of the past. The economy that our kids are going to be growing up in is not going to be based around ownership. It's going to be based around sharing. It's not going to be centered around acquiring. It's going to be centered around experiencing. And so it's not just the format of money that is changing, but the things that we use it for and how we spend it that is changing as well. And as a parent, I have to admit that there is a hell of a lot that really scares me and that I don't understand about the future. But when I was preparing for this talk, I realized that there was a lot that my parents and my grandparents before them were scared of also. Whether it was a brain-frying Pokemon crisis, or Elvis's hips, <laughs> we're all still here. And teaching our children about the value of money is as much about the transactional utility of money as it is about understanding the things it allows us to achieve. My mother was able to use money to turn her passion into a career and a career to fuel her passion at a time where she was supposed to do something completely different. It allowed our friends from Denmark to move a whole country into drinking its own tap water. <laughs> money is how we incentivize an entire community to come together and solve problems. So it doesn't matter what form money is going to take, whether it's tangible or whether it's digital, whether it's euros, dollars, Bitcoin, or wallow. As long as we can talk about money with our children, without shame, without fear, and without it becoming a taboo, and as long as we can help them understand that the value of money is as much about the sweet things in life as well as the necessary ones, then we can truly turn their understanding of the value of money into a superpower they can one day use to live the lives that they want to live and do the things that they love to do. Thank you.